Can everybody, can everybody hear me? Uh, first, I'd like to thank Dave. Dave, I've worked very closely with Dave for a number of years. He's handled all of our IP and uh, has really uh, been great at not only doing that, but introducing us to people in the community. Uh, so this is a little different talk than uh, this is my group, uh, who is responsible for a lot of this stuff, in particular uh, Vitaly Galinsky. Uh, and what I'd like to talk about is a little different than I normally uh, give, uh, so I'm going to throw in some business angles here. And uh, actually, at the end, the last bit of this talk is going to be really questions for the audience um, about um, uh, ideas related to commercialization, which I'd actually like to hear from people afterwards. Uh, the main uh, idea behind this, uh, basically all of the work in my laboratory, is that imaging is really exploration now. It's, just not, it's not just documentation. And a lot of that has to do with the advancing technologies. On the left is some early imaging studies. Uh, on the right is the first MR image uh, by Paul Otterber, and that's what an MR image looks like today. And uh, I'm going to talk about neuro-MRI, which is a result of how good the scanners are, and it's basically these three methods which uh, show you brain anatomy, uh, structural connectivity, and functional connectivity, and I call that neuro-MRI. Uh, the MRI market uh, continues to grow uh, steadily, but the neuro-MRI market is really growing fast, and that's, a, that's MRI scans per year. However, as the data gets more complex, the analysis is much more difficult. And that's really what my, that's the reason my lab formed, uh, because uh, it's really not just a matter of image acquisition, it's really trying to figure out what's in the data. So I'm going to talk about three problems related to those three different imaging modalities um, and relate those to some uh, economic factors as we go. The first one is brain morphology. So what most people are used to is qualitative imaging. So if you go to a hospital, radiologists do qualitative imaging. They're looking for something different. We're interested in quantitative imaging. This is a physicist view of it. It's a circular brain. As data gets better and better, you start to see more and more detail. And when you start to see more detail, then you can start to ask a whole bunch of questions. Is that normal anatomy? Is that uh, different among different people? What does it say about evolution and biology? Anything you can imagine. So what happens is you get a whole series of questions. And really what you want to do is to be able to quantitate these. So here's the standard state of the art uh, for brain morphology. Uh, and that's to take a high resolution image uh, to do some sort of surface definition, often by hand. Segment, by segment we mean separate out gray and white matter. Construct some sort of surface. And then if you want to fit that mathematically, you have to do some, uh, jump through a bunch of hoops to fit that. So the problem with that is that it uh, is laborious, time consuming. It's about 14 hours to do that. Error prone uh, for many, many technical reasons and also non-technical, just humans doing that. So we came up with a new method, which we call the spherical wave decomposition, which takes a brain and fits it like that in 10 seconds. And it, does a, it, just, it doesn't actually do any surfaces. It just fits a volume. So not only is it really fast, but as a byproduct, you actually get automatic segmentation, and it doesn't have any of the problems associated with the methods on the right, which is the standard package. So this leads directly to a very important clinical problem, which is cortical thickness measurements, which is something that I will show a little bit later also in the context of Alzheimer's work. Uh, but it allows you to very rapidly separate gray and white matter and then do quick measurements. And in fact, it's so fast that you can do something new, which is to mine data. So there's a, for those of you in Alzheimer's, there's a database called the ADNI, which has hundreds and hundreds of patients, and we were able to do 600 in a very short amount of time. Okay, so problem number two is a method called diffusion tensor imaging. Diffusion tensor imaging is a really cool thing in MRI, which allows you to actually non-invasively look at the local 
uh, molecular diffusion of water in the brain. And because it's moving along white matter fibers, it's anisotropic, and so it allows you to reconstruct brain fibers. Now, qualitatively, this is what a standard image looks like, and you, the white happens to be white matter. It's not white. It's called white matter, but it looks like that. But diagnosing something like traumatic brain injury, you don't really see anything. So in diffusion imaging, the image on the right is actually a very different map. It's a map of the local diffusion uh, property. But that's the standard way that people do it. The problem is that that region there that's dark is completely an artifact of the way that people process the data. And it turns out this is a complicated physics problem. And so the, the result of that is it has to do with the fact that the brain's got lots of fibers crossing everywhere. So the problem is when you try and create tracks, those tracks, some of them don't show up. Well, that's not so good if you're doing, here's pre-surgical planning, which is something that we're working on. This is not our image. Uh, we've started working with a group at Hopkins where if you want to resect a tumor, you want to make sure that you don't, you don't resect fibers that are viable. So you want to do tractography in a way which is consistent. So diffusion tensor images uh, have errors that then can lead to, to clinical errors. It's one of the reasons it's not actually used that much in hospitals. So we have a new method for that, and it's called GoESP. And it creates something on the right which doesn't suffer from that uh, and is able to map the white matter and therefore doesn't have problems with tracking. So this is kind of a cool image because you're tracking almost all of the fibers that we can see in the brain. And it actually shows a, a unique structure of the brain that was uh, uh, a mathematical structure of the brain that was uh, previously not really known. Uh, and so uh, this has uh, implications for um, pre-surgical planning, but also for a whole lot of other things. It turns out this allowed us to create a new method of imaging called eigenmode imaging. And this allows us to non-invasively look at the major connected regions of the brain. So those images are major connected modes of the brain, but this was done automatically. And there's also another really unique feature of this, which is that it turns out that the resolution of this is about 10 times higher than the scanner, which is really interesting. And uh, a, so a typical scanner, like a three Tesla MRI scanner, it's about a million dollars a Tesla. That's kind of the number we use. And people often want to go very, very high fields to get higher resolution. So that would be seven Tesla, which would be seven million. So there's also a huge potential economic benefit in being able to do that at a low field, lower field. This we're actually looking at TBI. So we're looking at traumatic brain injury because we want to see what regions of the brain are uh, disruptive of those modes. So the problem number three is functional MRI. Everyone's kind of heard of functional MRI. Uh, the old school functional MRI is you tap your fingers and you look at the motor cortex light up. You tap on, you tap off, you tap on, you tap off. The data analysis is basically correlating that stimulus with the brain. Once again, the scanners have gotten so good that what you can do now is you don't have to tap. You just lie in the scanner and the scanner can detect lots of activity. The problem is, is that any particular brain is different from any other brain, and this rest, so-called resting state is a whole bunch of nonlinear, non-periodic fluctuations that are just happening. And that data analysis problem is incredibly hard. So the current state of the art is called independent components analysis, and you get something like this, which is really noisy. And in our group, our view is really what we're after is single subject. One of the problems with a lot of these techniques is you can, if you look at uh, papers on resting state, they'll take many, many subjects and average them together. But every brain is different. So we're working, for example, with a group that's looking at mood disorders and drugs, and you really want to detect very small variations between uh, individuals. Uh, and it's very costly, as I am told constantly by people we talk to. And you guys know better than I do. So we have a new method for this called the entropy field decomposition. And 
that produces single subject results which are really clean. And there's really, other than the, this algorithm, there really isn't any other processing done to this. There's, there's no fixes of any, ad hoc fixes of any sort. I'll get back to this because it turns out this technique is really general for a lot of other applications that have nothing to do with uh, medicine. So we have a platform called Quest. I guess the first business question would be, should we have a different name for that? Because people tell me that's a boring name. But it has all three of these built into it, and it's built on, uh, on top of a visualization package that we've also developed. Uh, and so we're using it. Here, here's one of the, our major clinical focuses as an Alzheimer's. So we've just been funded to apply these techniques for Alzheimer's. Um, so Alzheimer's is obviously a huge issue uh, monetarily and the health of people in the U.S. and the world, and only getting worse. <laughs> And this, these slides actually have some current news, which is that 99% uh, failure rate for the drugs. And just as of a few days ago, you probably saw this, where Pfizer stopped doing this. Part of this has to do with the fact that there are basically two hypotheses for Alzheimer's, and one is a complete failure. One is the amyloid plaque hypothesis, which is that amyloid plaques are causing it, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence of that, well, 99% failure rate for the drugs. The other is often called the Brock hypothesis, and that's that it's related to neurofibrillary tangles. And I should say that the Alzheimer's work I do here is with uh, Dr. Mark Bondi, who's in, um, uh, also at UCSD. He's the Alzheimer's expert. I am not. But it does bring up the question of how do you look at neurofibrillary tangles? And the idea is that this starts in the locus ceruleus, which is a tiny part of the brain stem. So this immediately brings up the question of, can you do fiber track mapping in some tiny little region? Well, only if you know how to do diffusion imaging the right way, and uh, it's very sensitive to uh, algorithm problems. So uh, here we've thrown our techniques at it, and I'm just showing you now examples of those three techniques in this clinical setting. So this is cortical thickness measurements. Uh, again, uh, we don't really need very many subjects to do that, and the red spots show cortical thinning. So the cortical thinning, uh, and then again, we're looking, uh, for those of you who may or may not be familiar with the ADNI database, we're reanalyzing that, and the idea is to see patterns of cortical thinning. Uh, here's tractography through the locus ceruleus, which is a really, really hard thing to do. There are tons and tons of fibers going through there. But we're able to do that, and we're able to see if that pathway, and the, the thing on the, the picture on the right is an eigenmode image created from those tracks, which tells us what the highest probability pathways are. And you can actually look along that pathway and see if there is degradation, and it seems to correlate well with the Brock hypothesis. That's, that grant has just been funded and just starting, so very, very early stages. And then the last part is using the uh, EFD for looking at spatial temporal patterns in uh, activation. And as I mentioned, we're also doing a drug study with a group in Oklahoma. Uh, I'm just going to add this as a side note. This, this method, uh, we have a method called Jester, which combines all of these together, and we're actually now combining fMRI and EEG, uh, which may even be a bigger market because EEG is so much cheaper than fMRI. But figuring out how those two relate to one another is a non-trivial thing. So we're just, just beginning that. Okay. So um, these methods are very, are very flexible. So they're, they're, they're for MRI, at least I've shown them for MRI, but there's other applications which are um, useful. Um, this is, I, I would say, one of the open questions that come up when we talk about business models um, is that uh, I often get uh, told, well, just, just do one thing or the other. And um, I'll show you what the other is, <laughs> because uh, it's not uh, obviously related uh, in any way. Uh, th this came about, let me show you a little summertime in Zurich, which is one application uh, for this in another field. <clears throat> Actually, it's not Zurich, Switzerland that's of interest. It's another Zurich that you probably don't know. Zurich, Kansas. 
Not many people have heard of that. So this is what Zurich, Kansas looked like in the summer. So weather gets really bad there, and that has gigantic economic uh, implications. So tornadoes are formed from supercell thunderstorms, which is one of those right there. And as it turns out, they actually have a pretty complex and dynamic anatomy, but it's somewhat repeatable. And uh, you can see here different structures. I don't know if anyone here grew up in the Midwest or the Plains. Somebody did. So you're probably familiar with this. And across the country are these things, which are called NEXRAD systems. Uh, we just call them AD-8Ds. And those are the radars that are typically used for uh, aviation, which is what I'm aiming at here. And they cover the country. But uh, they cover a wide swath of the country. But the resolution, of course, is not so great. And you get what's called the warning problem, which is that, uh, for those of you who watched the weather during these, you get signatures from these radars which uh, look like the characteristic of uh, a tornadic supercell, but some form and some don't. So what you're really looking at is can you understand what the dynamics, and it really becomes something not unlike the, the brain imaging problem. So here's the cost of the warning. Here's, here's a classic hook echo from the Joplin tornado. And just as in Alzheimer's, early detection is critical. And the implications of that from, a, one, one could say financially from an insurance standpoint, is that's the same corner right after that. So you can get closer measurements. This is what's called a Doppler. This is the Doppler on wheels that we work with. And the idea here is to be able to get very close measurements and really understand uh, tornado genesis, how do tornadoes form, and understand better the relationship between those storms and the larger storms. So here's the most studied tornado ever, which is in Goshen County, Wyoming. And here's an example of using that analysis. So the top is just uh, contouring of the reflectivity data. And the bottom here is uh, the EFD looking at multi-scale in both time and space structure. So you can imagine that this is the kind of thing that when applied, applied to radar data might give you a better indication of um, not only where tornadoes might be, but sort of larger scale structure that influences uh, thunderstorms. Uh, we also work closely with Dr. Lee Orff, who does simulation, because validation is big. And I didn't really mention this, but in the neuro MRI, one of the things that my group does, which is really, I think, important, is that uh, we build numerical models in order to validate our techniques. Um, that's a whole other subject, but for example, diffusion imaging in the brain, there really isn't any way to um, validate that. So what you can do, me, validate it meaning if you have a new analysis method. So what we do is we build numerical models, we build large scale simulations of diffusion, and then we see if we get the correct thing. And here's an, here's an example here where we're able to detect the key vorticity features from that field. So it's picking out of, and if you've ever looked at meteorological data, there's just so much going on. Uh, it's very hard to pick stuff out. Um, when you go to the Storm Prediction Center in uh, the National Weather Center, Oklahoma, they're still doing a lot of visual analysis. They're incredibly good at it, though, but they're still doing that. So the impact on aviation is huge, actually. So here is uh, weather. The, this is, uh, there's numerous studies out there, but uh, weather is a huge factor. Uh, and you can see, interestingly, it's the summer months. So it's when the thunderstorms come in. And here's this little pie chart that in that summer, it's mostly convective weather. So that means thunderstorms. So there's a lot of uh, issues here. One is obviously safety. That's, that's key. Um, 
But there's, delays are interesting and so is fuel. So it, it, to prepare for this talk, I was trying to get some of this data. It's not the easiest data in the world to get. Um, I, I guess it's guarded by airlines. Um, but they will tell you that crew scheduling, plane scheduling has impacts and uh, really optimal flight planning is uh, important. So um, cost of delays, I did find this number, $31 billion. And, and really the important point here is that it's with thunderstorms, not really tornadoes, but th thunderstorms where they need to do planning for the pathways ahead of time. So, they need, so there is a detection problem that has some sort of uh, constrained time frame. Now there's another aspect of this which is called microbursts. So tornadoes come from these big storms, but there's another effect which is um, that there are these sudden downbursts. And um, this is actually a somewhat, a somewhat famous problem. Um, this was the cause of Delta Flight 191, but it was also one of the great successes in, in meteorology history. So it was figured out by actually Ted Fujita, who the F scale is named for, that this was caused by a microburst. So you don't really see this kind of accident anymore because the airports have these detectors. But we're working with Lee Orff. Again, here's a model of this. And the reason for this is that the importance here is that structures get damaged, power lines get damaged, buildings get damaged. And if you can pick out the salient features from this, then you have a much better idea of uh, how to construct and plan for uh, these uh, events. Plus, it's just a really cool simulation. And it's pretty close. Here's, here's an amazing thing I found on, uh, that someone did. I actually got a photograph of one, a video, which is amazing. So they're really beautiful from far away, but they're really not very nice up close. Uh, it, I hope <laughs> So you can imagine that uh, causes a lot of structural damage. So there's, again, there's a lot of economic um, reasons for, for figuring these out. And actually Lee's main point, uh, he says he works with the power grid people because that's a, that's a really big um, loss for them. So uh, the last couple slides, uh, I just wanted to put up uh, really questions for, for the audience and things that I think about, um, which is that, um, Clearly, there's some, uh, well, a lot of medical applications here. Um, but how do you, and I use the word integrate. I wasn't sure what the best word is, but you know, they're scanner companies. How do, you, how do you get them involved? How do you get them to buy into something like this? Um, big scanner, big pharma. Uh, how do you integrate with current hospital procedures, such as pre-surgical planning? So for example, the diffusion work that we do, there's a component in pre-surgical planning that exists already within some of their software. Um, how do you negotiate that so that uh, they use your method as opposed to something which may not work as well? And is there a basic research market? So for example, in China, there actually is a big research market uh, because they don't have as many people uh, at universities writing software like we do. So we actually uh, work with some, uh, are talking with some people there. Um, the meteorological applications uh, seem like they are uh, important. And um, uh, so obviously working with the National Weather Service. Well, one nice thing about this field is it's a pretty small field. So you quickly get to know the people um, at the top. And uh, there seems to be interest there, but that's not the same thing as uh, monetizing. Um, so these are all sort of open questions that I think about, but that are on the business side. And would like to, oh, I do have a lawyer friend, so he said, put that last line in there. That's not my idea, but. <laughs> I said, okay. Anyway, so that's the end, and I would just like to say that, that really the, um, the idea that surrounds all the work in the lab is that uh, really there's so much imaging data, and it's, um, <laughs> 
there's a lot of, uh, say, physics involved in trying to understand the dynamics and get some information out of it, but uh, devil's in the details, so. So that's it, and uh, open to open to questions. Thanks. Yeah. I have a question regarding your quest uh, data. Mm -hmm. you, you talked about the Brock um, thinking. Yeah. And then uh, and the ability to do that. Um, I am really blown away by the fact that you uh, put a big cross. Uh, on yeah. the A-beta hypothesis, I don't think, I think it's far from there. Yeah, I'm, by the way, I'm not the expert in Alzheimer's, I think. You can't get away from the fact that A-beta comes first and tangles from 15 years later. So my question to you is, whereas you can do all of this rough staging, mm -hmm. can, you go, can you go earlier? Because if not, it's too late already for any kind of diagnostic test for Alzheimer's. And well. do you have any ability to look at a beta, uh, either deposition or hippocampal volume changes yes. or whatever. Again, so, so um, again, I will say the expert in this is, is Mark Bondi's group, but they do all of those. So they have a, lar a long history of looking at um, uh, a beta, they do all the staging, they do um, uh, all the neuropsych testing, so, and they also have a uh, long history of working with the anti database. Uh, but Mark's been, Mark's been a long believer in the Brock hypothesis and was the one who came to us and said, we need a way to look at the local serialities. So the problem there, and we've uh, this has been told this many times, is that tracking through there is by standard methods just just doesn't work. So if there's, if there's any possibility of tracking the, that, um, Progression. There's no way to. There's no other way to do that. So, um, but, the, but the progression starts early. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You, by yeah. the time you get to, to tangle formation, mm -hmm. it's 15 years too late. 15 years. 15 years. I have a general question. I know people have a question, but just a general question regarding your technology. This yeah. is fascinating, by the way. Um, yeah. I did step out a couple of times, so I don't know if you mentioned this. Yeah. What are other similar technologies that people in the world develop? And is there someone on your tail? Is there something similar that allows people to do this? Because that may answer some of the questions that you have about the economics, the, the development. Yeah, I mean, not really. I mean, it, it, it depends on, we can name, each of these is compared with an existing algorithm. So it depends which one. So in the, the, um, the diffusion tensor, for example, there's actually a fundamental difference in the way that we think about that than other people think about it. Um, if people are interested in the technical side of that, the basic problem in diffusion imaging is that there's sort of a, um, a phallus. That, well, people measure everything in a voxel. Okay, so everything is measured independently in a voxel. And then the tracking is done after that. So the first step of that assumes that everything is independent of everything. The second step assumes that it's related to everything. And those actually both can't be true. So we have a method that actually uses surrounding information. And it uses an idea that we published in uh, basically a physics paper that just shows that information propagates in a, in a lattice in a certain way. And you can use that information. So it's not unlike, in some ways, like Google search works, where you look at neighboring, neighboring uh, concepts here we're actually looking at voxel data. So it's, there is no other technique that does that. What people talk about now in global tractography is they still do the same sort of local measurement. They create tracks and then they come up with a way to sort of parse them. But that's something very different. In all of the spatial temporal stuff, what's interesting is it's actually using the same idea. It's looking at correlations in the spatial temporal domain. And the remarkable thing about that is that uh, it reduces the number of possible um, data sets consistent with your data format. So it's actually an information theory idea. So it, it really sort of independent of the data. I wonder if you can use some investing, but anyway, that's a separate. There was a question back there. Uh, have you 
study work on the vasculature of the brain uh, as it relates to stroke prevention or uh, prediction? No, we haven't. Do you see that application as a potential use here? Uh, it's possible. Um, the structures of the, of the vasculature might be weakened at some point in time and lead to a stroke. That's what we're doing. <clears throat> so, so we're not we're typically not looking at vascular structures. There are MRI techniques such as uh, arterial spin labeling and perfusion techniques, which are looking at vascular structures. So we're not actually looking at vascular structures. Um, having said that, if you had a way to map vascular structures and you, if the idea is to look at their connectivity, then that's something that we could do. But but we haven't done anything in the stroke. There are diffusion changes in the stroke. Um, and so uh, you could look at that. Typically, people look at um, uh, there's a change in the diffusion coefficient. Um, however, it does bring up a good point, which I should mention. What, one of the areas that we work a lot in uh, also is there's other parts of the body besides the brain. Uh, and we do, do diffusion imaging in muscle. And, and one of the problems in trying to make a connection between the diffusion measurements and what you see clinically is that, uh, so when people do diffusion measurements in muscle injury, they basically all, all say the same thing. The anisotropy goes down, so it's really non-specific. So to model that is a, is again, it's a physics modeling problem. So we're working with a, a group in orthopedics, same words group, where we're actually doing uh, modeling of muscle tissue, uh, so building models of muscle tissue in the computer, and also doing printing of models and then imaging them and trying to correlate that with the measurements that we see in actual disease models. So it's a good point that it, I, my feeling is that in order to make any of these actually viable, you need to really have some good physical, physiologic model of what's happening. And, and that's actually one of the really hard parts to do. Is you can take images all you want, but unless you have a, a really good model, um, that it's really hard to make any, any uh, decisions about it. So we do large-scale diffusion modeling and model the brain, and it's why we work in the severe weather stuff with people who are modeling, because then we can look at, say, if we know we're getting. So how do you do a 10 times better resolution than well-symmetric part? That's a good question. So uh, the, the reason you can do 10 times better resolution is that, um, so, the way that we construct these tracks is that uh, we're making, um, we're, we're looking at a, a grid of uh, measurements and we're, uh, we're making connectivity through all of that. And those are subsampled uh, in any voxel. So the tracking through any voxel is subsampled. But the number of fibers we're actually tracking is like hundreds of millions. So actually within any voxel, you have a huge number of measurements through that voxel sub-voxel measurement. And they're, they're actually quite consistent because it's not just in a voxel, it's something that's, that's connected throughout you know, uh, large portions of the brain. So you can look at any part of a voxel and you have that subsampling, and it's actually quite accurate. So it's subsampled in order, you know, in order of magnitude, and so you see very clear fibers that go through that. But it's because you're connecting, you're not just looking at an individual voxel. Right? So you're looking at a voxel, and you're looking at something which has been estimated a track that goes through that voxel, which has very high reliability. So on that note, there, there, is a, there is a paper that appeared in um, 2012 in Science that said that the brain is constructed as the streets of Manhattan. Anyone see that paper? <laughs> Quite a famous paper. It says that the, that the fibers in the brain are at right angles to one another. And that's not true. So if we showed we showed in a paper that was a neural computation, so that's not true. And the reason that comes about is that uh, if you have fibers that are crossing, uh, this is sort of a technical issue, you can resolve these, but as the angle between those in any one voxel gets small, you either get this or you get this. And so what you get is you get things that look like they're not going to be But with our method, because you're connecting everything up uh, throughout this lattice, you can resolve fibers down to eight degrees. 
So you can track things to the thing eight degrees, which means in any one voxel, you actually have a huge number of um, pathways. So the 10 times the 90 degrees? Uh, no, the, the, the 10 times is simply that, that because we can resolve the eight degrees, that we actually can. Uh, so those measurements are, are um, significant to like 60 sigma, because we're tracking like a trillion fibers. So, you have, with any box, you have a very good distribution of what those fiber inputs look like. And because you have a, 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 a very um, strong, uh, accurate, um, at any one point in that voxel, that, you know, so you have fibers crossing from all over, and throughout that voxel region, you have <coughs> a whole spread. It's very accurate. So you can sort of move from one location to the next, and there might be something like this within that. Again, it's related to connectivity. And then, um, what, what other sort of problems or data sets might that kind of analysis be like? That's a good question. Um, well, okay, so there's, there's, um, there's a few. One of the things that we did, which was, um, you can actually apply it to the functional data, which is sort of odd. So people think of tractography as being diffusion tractography. So we came up with something which is that in the spatial temporal domain, so that we have um, activity. So, so when you, again, the same, the same concept is that you're looking at, you're actually looking at correlations in the data. That's what's interesting, is the correlations in the data tell you what are the realistically viable solutions. So if you have a in diffusion imaging, you look at neighboring in fMRI, we look at neighboring space-time boxes. So it turns out that you actually get a space-time correlation, and you can actually track through, you can do functional tractography. So you get tracks of brain function, uh, spatial temporal pathways, and you can use that same. But I think there's other data sets you can use this for, because it really, well, actually, the meteorological data. So the meteorological data, is the best example, which is that um, when you're trying to, so the, the, the way that people think, for example, tornadoes occur, it is probably wrong, which is that um, the, the dynamics of the, um, the, the storm, uh, there's, a, there's a rear flank of the storm, and there's always this idea that there's what's called a rear flank downdraft, and then it pushes air up. In the simulations, it doesn't look like that at all. It looks like it comes from the forward flight. And one of the things that you can do to show that is you can do this tracking at ultra high resolution along the vorticity of the, of the front of that. And that's even closer to the front. But I think there's a lot of applications where you could do that. So we're sort of open to any ideas uh, about, about that sort of subsampling. I think it's, I mean, it's, it's sort of from a scanner standpoint, it's a huge win. Those, those, those uh, eigenmodes. Um, there, um, the, well, the, the algorithm used to do the functional MRI is exactly the same algorithm. That's what's interesting, is that there is no, the only thing that's different is that in, um, in the tornadoes you're introducing vorticity fields, so that's a vector field, so it's a, there's a vector field that we're using. But it's exactly the same algorithm, so it's, it's taking the data and it's looking at spatial temporal correlations in the data. They really, so the thing is, so I've been chasing with the, um, the that little truck, the Dalfarn Rose, I've been chasing with them since 2003. And their problems are, they have a lab problem, like they're trying to keep, they're trying to collect data in terrible conditions, so it's mostly hardware. So the software is, is not, I mean, they basically just do contours. But it's, that, that is a problem which, which really spans many areas you have nonlinear, non-periodic, spatially and temporally overlapping fluctuations. And that's what you have in the brain. You know, you have, so the thing is, when you look at the brain, you, know, you have parts of the brain which are doing multiple things, and they may be doing this. You know, it's not periodic, so they're doing something and it's overlapping, and different parts of the brain are lighting up. And 
you know, if you do a resting, if you and I sit in the magnet and both tap our fingers on and off, we'll probably get like this in the motor cortex. But if you lie in the magnet and I lie in the magnet and you do a resting state study and you had coffee and I did, well, if I had coffee and you did, mm -hmm. then they're going to look different. And if you are, if you are thinking about your work or something, I mean, so every brain is different. And the, the real question is, can you with a single subject uh, analyze that data? And it's, it's only if you can really separate out these really um, non-Gaussian overlapping fluctuations. But in that sense, the, the problem is actually the same. It really is the same object. The really fun thing about uh, simulation is that you can run them in reverse. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. Um, so, well, he, here's what we've done in, um, in, in simulation. Um, the, the muscle stuff's probably a good example where there are, um, there are different injury models. And the different injury models on a cellular level mean, you know, do, are, are quite different, right? But the problem in, the problem in all of uh, these imaging techniques, like, which I probably should have said at the very beginning, is uh, the volume element in an MRI scan, so a voxel, is millimeter cube. Let's just use that as a number, right? But brain fibers are 50 microns, and muscle fibers are. So you're always averaging over a lot of stuff, right? So it's really hard to make that connection. So with, without some sort of realistic model, it's really hard to, you can't just throw anything in there. And so by constructing realistic, but e even constructing a, like a realistic model of a muscle injury is hard. So you, so you try and make that connection between a simple model, which might be, you know, cylinders, that's sort of a physicist view of tissue, maybe randomly oriented, um, but then maybe with different permeability changes, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you can, you can take that simulation and run on a computer. And what, what really is pretty unique is this idea of 3D printing is pretty amazing because in the old days, you would do, and the old days is just a few years ago, that you would do um, some cylinder model, for example, and then you would uh, do a simulation. And so in my lab, we built a simulator, a computational simulator, which allows you to take any shape, any uh, physiological state. It runs the MRI experiment within that, so it tracks the water, and then it comes out with a signal, and that signal is however you would have generated on the scanner. And then you analyze it. So you can actually say what it is you can see. And it's pretty cool because scanner time is like $500 an hour. And that's, you know, the old crap and everything else. So you can run your experiments on the scanner. What's different now and really pretty cool is that uh, now there's that middle piece, which is you can take that computer simulated object and print it. And then you can actually make that and put it in the scanner. So then you can actually see. So that so that's what we're doing with that Dr. Woods um, orthopedics group, which is that uh, we're printing these, and, and there's also a nano engineering group that uses the Chef Chen group, which is you know they're printing these things, and so you can actually do that whole uh, that whole spectrum, and that really ultimately is what is what you want to do. scanner, what they consider the, the cool thing, which is track density imaging. So, without being offensive, the track density imaging is a poor man's version of the first few steps that could lead to eye 
Me meaning that on the, the skin, oh, one nice thing about the Human Connectome Project is we use just data off the web that other people are uh, publishing their stuff on. So we have seen this data. Um, they should put it on, uh, they're using, they, they're clinically using track density imaging already. So track density imaging is sort of doing the same thing, but they're, they're not doing the DPI in as accurate a way. And um, so it already is being used. So, so that's, okay, so that's my question for the audience, which is, so we've sat down with the Siemens people and said, and we also looked at how they do diffusion, and I knew the guy who was you know, in charge of their North American uh, sort of research software stuff. And I said, you should just let us do it. It's done. And they had internal people working on it, and they actually gave a talk at the conference, and I said, yeah, we never did talk to that way. But that, that becomes a business question. So, Are you, <clears throat> this is Ruben. Uh, so, that was kind of where I was going with that question. Uh, you had a, a great set of questions that you want to ask the audience, and I, I want to invite everybody to participate and, and pitch in and try to answer some of those questions. You know, um, I work with uh, Matt Budoff at Harbor UCLA Medical Center, who is one of the foremost imaging experts in CT scans. He developed uh, algorithms to use existing data sets and do retrospective analysis and um, uh, to calcium calcification scores and, and all the kinds of stuff that you can do before. And Siemens and GE are now incorporating that um, uh, algorithm into their scans, right? As long as there's a, a, a medical need that, um, that you can identify or solve. So first of all, happy to put you in touch with Matt uh, in case, because he's got all the connections with all these big companies. But also, where are you in, in working with a medical group here in San Diego to you know do some analysis about what your technology can do to help improve whatever you know medical outcomes they're looking at. Right. Well, so uh, I would so we 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 picked the groups and uh, we so we're working with uh, uh, Sam Ward's muscle group. We're working very closely with Mark Bondi's group, who is a uh, big Alzheimer's group. So that's we're really pushing that hard. And and there the focus really is, as I tried to show, on uh, going back to look at data sets that other people look at. So if you talk to people in Alzheimer's, they say look at the so we're redoing the measurements on cortical thickness, for example, because that every company I've talked to said that we do that. Um, the tractography, we basically had people come up and say, we've tried to do that and can't do that. Um, and the functional stuff is just a, another, another part of that. The functional stuff that we're working with a group in Tulsa, which is looking at very subtle mood disorders. So they have a mood disorder group there. And we're just beginning on, on doing that. And that's very important. I'm not sure if that answers your question exactly, but, um, but it, that, that's actually something you think about a lot, how, how, to, how to get this um, productized. As far, see, the, the scanners have their own research groups, some degree, and they're somewhat um, they're really tough not to track, I think. The last, the last time I went back to the same guy who was in sales. So, but, uh, yeah. So I'll, so I'll mention, um, I, I guess a, a good case study for this would be the pre-surgical planning. So um, the pre-surgical planning was what Siemens told us was important. And then we found the guy on the brochure uh, who has the pre-surgical planning, um, uh, Jay Flay, who's at Hopkins, and called him and he said, yeah, in fact, the diffusion tensor 
So we're now working with them, and that's a, that's a great case. Now, however, we did have someone come to us who was a, um, an investor. He said, oh, wow, this looks, this looks great. You can do this. It's like a giant market, et cetera, et cetera. However, pre-surgical planning diffusion tensor imaging software is one part of the suite of the program. And their question was, well, well, I don't know. They kind of, they, 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 I think there was an issue of how do you get that into a company's suite. I mean, because obviously there's other stuff you need to do. There's surgery, there's high resolution and stuff. Um, and uh, so that's, that's sort of a secondary issue. You know, you have a technology which is an important part of another technology. Maybe there's a big hurdle to overcome getting it into I, I, I don't know. But, but I think the point, that's a great point, because that's, we identified that as something which, you know, it's actually one of the few things where you can uh, validate, it because the brain is open, right? Yeah, so. so. But, but I, I totally agree. I mean, the, I, I know the Alzheimer's stuff, it, it's a big market. But it's obviously very contentious, <laughs> which is why I avoid the Alzheimer's questions. We're, we're looking from the technical standpoint. Yeah. 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 That's, that's a, a great point. We, we, we try, I mean, we have done some of that, but I'm sure we could do more. Um, but, but I think what we need to do is look at the way you fill it out there and some other things like that. It might be able to give you a, an informal feedback to say, these are the companies we're having struggle with. Yeah, actually, um, I, that, right, I, sh I should mention actually there's someone who joined our department um, recently from Toshiba. And they came and, and we asked them that, and they said, here's a good problem. But I, I agree with you completely. That if there's a if there's a more efficient way for me to do that, because they have these big kind of roadmaps of what they where their machines are going to be in five, ten, fifteen yeah. years time. And I'll be, I think you could potentially dilute into lots of those targets down the line. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll do that in future studies. That that would be that would be fantastic. Because I, I really do completely agree. I think one of the things that's been a learning experience for me is that you know in that from the research standpoint, you are you know you sort of focused on a few of these things and you get, you know, there's people at the university doing research, but ultimately you want to find out what's the, what's the big bang clinical thing. What, what is it they really want to do? And uh, so I, I do completely that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's four, I think four or five major uh, scanner manufacturers. Yep. These are the guys that are going to sell what you have to offer. And when you go to them and find out what they need and work with them. Uh, they go in and train. Uh, you know, new things come out all the time. So let's say pre-surgical planning, and you said, well, it's all set and all this stuff. But when something new and better comes out, Siemens and uh, GE and Fujifilm and Toshiba, they'll go out, uh, train their, their uh, and send their trainers out uh, to get these new techniques implemented. I'm curious, has anyone here worked with a scanner manufacturer before? Oh, hey, Alex. <laughs> Our chairman. He, he has. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, dynamic. That, that, that's all I'll say. So, um, and, and uh, it's, so. Well, again, I'm not going to hold their door. What's that? find the one that wants to work with you. Well, yeah, but all of them is four. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, a, 
quadropoly or whatever you want to call it. I mean, there's GE, there's Siemens, there's Philips, there's Toshiba. Hitachi, maybe. But I mean, it sort of depends where you are. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, whenever I, okay, whenever I talk to those people, to be honest with you, I feel like I have the wrong degree. I wish I had an MBA and I knew how to really speak to them. But they're, I mean, they, um, it's, it's a tough nut to crack. I mean, again, I've spoken with their head, their head people, and they have a lot of money invested in their own programs. Um, it, it, it goes, I have to say, it goes beyond my level of understanding of, of that world. Although I do know people <coughs> who it, and one of them said to me, oh, you think the scanner companies are trying to make logical decisions? Where do you get that idea? <laughs> so, uh, it's a big company, there's a lot of stuff, you know, so, um, but, but any, any ideas on how to crack that, I, my feeling is that, um, and, and maybe what you were getting at, I mean, if you have some, if you actually know some people in these companies who are, who are really dedicated to getting some new technology and have the foresight to do it, you know, look, I'll, I'll give you a great example. Okay, the Siemens, when the Siemens came out to sell us some scanners a number of years ago, Siemens at the time, maybe still, had by far the best scanner for diffusion imaging, by far, phenomenal. It's a result of the human connection. The guy who gave the talk is a physicist I've known for 20 something years. Great guy. The tractography they showed was run through a program that I know, I know who wrote it, and I know it doesn't work. And the images were, and I said, you got a Ferrari and you put those tiny little tires on it. Like, to me, that, that's surprising to me, right? I said, look, we have an algorithm that works, you should just do it now. But it, it, it doesn't seem to work that way. But again, I think part of that is my ignorance of the field. Yeah. You can't start at the top, you can't start with sales yeah. He was not a sales he was a very high up guy in the company. Okay. But you've got to find the people who are developing this stuff. I, I agree. I, I agree that I did, that I, that, that is something about it. That, that, that is something that I'm sure there is another way to do it. Yeah, not the people who are coming off the field to do the back and the side. Yeah, he, he wasn't your average sales. They like the fire under them, they'll, they'll push it up. It may not be easy to find. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we do have uh, hosted hors d'oeuvres and cocktail uh, wine and beer outside. So if folks would, uh, if we maybe time for one last question and then oh, yeah. we can transition. Out and uh, feel free to come up and uh, meet Larry individually and share any thoughts that uh, you didn't want to voice in front of the crowd. And I would like <laughs> to thank you, Larry. That was a no, fantastic talk. Thank you.